few weeks ago, I had the opportunity to speak with a friend of mine who's a, a businessman in Orlando, and he was telling me all about the latest developments in the international uh, world of finance, and he talked about a study that had been made of international corporations in terms of their future planning. And he mentioned that there were Japanese corporations that didn't have simply three-year plans or five-year plans for their businesses, but some of them extended their business plans out into time a hundred and two hundred years so that they had an overarching goal that they kept before them at all times so that they could check periodically to make sure that everything that they were doing in their company was on target. Now, after this businessman related all of this to me about what was going on in the international field of finance, he looked at me and he said, now, about the Christian life, R.C., he said, tell me, please, what is the big idea? What's the big idea of Christianity? Now, I have to admit that when he looked at me straight in the eye and said, R.C., what's the big idea? I flinched a little bit, and I had a flashback in my own mind to my mother standing there when I was a child with her hands on her hips, and then she would take her right hand and point it at me, and she would say, what's the big idea, young man? Now, obviously, that really wasn't a question that she was trying to, d d to find out what I thought was the quintessential purpose of my life, but she was uh, really giving a thinly veiled accusation, like you have no possible justification for what you've just done now in your behavior. What's the big idea? But from another perspective, that is a crucial question. We listen to sermons, we read the Scriptures, we get caught up in the maze of the details of theology, but we long for the opportunity to cut through all of the fine points, the, uh, the particulars of Christianity, and get down to the core, the very essence of what the Christian life is all about. That's what we mean by uh, discerning the big idea. So when this businessman said, R.C., what's the big idea? I thought about it for a moment, and the answer that popped into my head came out of the 16th century Reformation when the Protestant reformers of that time had to define themselves to a watching world. And so they had to crystallize the essence of what their ministry and their movement was about. And out of that crystallization process came a phrase, of course it was Latin, that was introduced and used frequently by Martin Luther to declare the essence of the Christian life. And Luther used this phrase, that the essence of the Christian life is to live one's life quorum Deo. Now, that may be a strange phrase to, to you, quorum Deo. Literally what it means is before the face of God. And what Luther was saying simply was this, that the Christian life means to live all of your life in the presence of God. You know, sometimes we behave and perform with our lives not for God but for an audience that's here, and that our behavior when we're in secret may be different from how we behave when we're in the presence of people whose judgment or approval we seek. We think, for example, of the prodigal son when he pled with his father to receive his inheritance early, how he uh, squandered that money, but before he squandered that inheritance, what did he do? He went away into a far country where he was anonymous, where no one knew him where he didn't feel like he had to, to live under the scrutiny of somebody who might possibly disapprove of what he was doing. Now, Luther says we should live our whole lives not as people seeking the cover of darkness where we have a secret life, a private life that is hidden from the gaze 
of our friends or of authorities, but that our lives should be lived openly in the presence of God, before the face of God, practicing a kind of consciousness of God from moment to moment. Now, we add to that a couple of other ideas, that the, the big idea of, of Christianity is to live Coram Deo, to live all of one's life in the presence of God, under the authority of God, and to the honor and to the glory of God. Let me say that again. The big idea, Coram Deo, is to live one's life in the presence of God, under the authority of God, to the honor and glory of God. That's what it's all about. Jesus said it succinctly this way, if you love me, keep my commandments, which is to say, if you want to please me, you please me by doing what I have commanded you to do. But to live this kind of life, uh, obviously, at, at the outset, sounds rather idealistic, doesn't it? There's nobody that lives all of their life in a constant sense of the presence of God, and none of us is, is uh, so righteous that everything that we do uh, is in submission to the authority of God and done unto His honor and to His glory. We can say that uh, religiously and define it theologically, but to put that into actual living practice is not a simple thing to do. We can get excited and emotionally moved and have spiritual experiences where we make vows and promises, oh God, you know, my life is yours, my heart is on the altar, I'm going to please you and live for you and so on. But through the day-to-day -day, uh, activities and the pressures that come upon us, that zeal and that excitement begins to fade and we fall back into our old patterns where we live in the absence of God, in defiance of God, and to our own glory. So what it means to please God is not simply to make a commitment or a vow, but to press forward through those moments and times where we are paralyzed and frustrated in our spiritual growth. Let me ask this question of, of the people. How many of you have ever taken piano lessons? Let me, let me see your hands. If you've taken piano lessons, <laughs> about three out of four uh, in the audience have responded here uh, that say that you have uh, taken piano lessons at some time in your life. Are any of you, incidentally, at the present time functioning as a concert uh, pianist? Can't find any of those in here. Isn't it strange that every year, well, not just every year, but over a course of years, literally millions of people in the United States of America start piano lessons. But there are so very, very few that ever become concert pianists like Von Cliburn or even great famous uh, jazz pianists, pianists like Thelonious Monk or Oscar Peterson or Sharing or or one of the others. I remember when I started taking piano lessons, my mother had a big idea, and she put her hands on her hips and said, young man, you're going to start taking piano lessons. And so she sent me off to this woman who was 110 years old, and she lived in a house that was 150 years old that was so musty and creaky and scary, and I had to walk over a mile through the woods and across a highway to go to the house of this piano teacher whose name, incidentally, was Miss Bliss. And do you know what a misnomer is? That is a misnomer. That woman's name was called Miss Bliss, and she brought anything but bliss into my life, doing all of these uh, exercises. But I remember vividly my first lesson. I came into this scary, creepy, old, musty house, and I sat down on this bench near, next to this woman who was as scary and creepy and musty as the house was, and she opened up to the first lesson of John Thompson's piano book series. And she showed me on the keyboard where Middle C was located. 
And then she told me to play middle C with my index finger, and I followed the first lesson on the page, and I even remember the words to it, as I would strike middle C repeatedly with my index finger and my right hand, the song went like this, I am playing middle C. Those of you with perfect pitch know I'm not singing middle C, but that's the way the words went. I am playing middle C. Then the left hand hit the same note. I can play it well, you see. I said, hey, this is a piece of cake. I started piano lessons with a flurry, with gusto. It was simple. And I ripped through the first half of John Thompson in just a few weeks, and I had visions of becoming a great pianist. Five years later, I quit taking piano lessons and I was only in the middle of John Thompson's second grade book. My development as a piano player was arrested. It was frozen. It reached a point of difficulty that signaled a plateau where I was stuck, and so I gave it up. Several years later, after I was married, I was in seminary. We had a dear friend in our home community who was a, an excellent piano teacher whose students were winning the Volkwein Studio uh, Piano Player of the Year Award in Pittsburgh. And I went to her and I said, uh, Mrs. Winterling, I said, would you be able to give me some piano lessons? She said, oh, absolutely, I'd love to give you piano lessons. And so I went to my first lesson with Mrs. Winterling. And I sat down, she said, well, what do you want to study? And I said, oh, Mrs. Winterling, I said, I have fallen in love with the music of Chopin. And so first thing I want to do is I want to learn Chopin's Nocturne in E flat. And she looked at me and smiled. She said, fine. She said, how much piano training have you had? And I said, well, I made it through the second half of John Thompson's, or the first half of John Thompson's second grade book. And she smiled and laughed. And she said, well, honey, she said, you can't possibly play Chopin's uh, Nocturne in E-flat. Yet yeah, that would be like a sixth grade level. She said, we'll have to pick up where you left off and build up to that. And, and maybe in a couple of years, we'll be able to start you on the Nocturne. I said, wait, you don't understand, Mr. Burnley. I said, I want to learn the nocturne now, right now. And again, she smiled and she knew me. She knew my impetuosity and all the rest. And, and uh, she said, okay, okay, RC. She said, I'll, I'll make a deal with you. We'll work on the nocturne right now as long as you promise to do these exercises that are remedial uh, along the way. And so she assigned me the first measure of the nocturne for the first week. And after six months, I finally was able to play the piece. But then uh, my piano studies were interrupted by going to Europe to graduate school, and I, I reached another plateau of pi playing piano where I was stuck. I was frozen. Couldn't go any further. Fifteen years later, I met a man who was a jazz player, and I listened to him play jazz, and he just blew me away. And he gave me uh, incentive to start up again, and so I began once more to take lessons, and again, was able to move to another plateau. Well, I don't want to bore you with this story of the history of my involvement in piano playing, but what I learned about life from studying the piano is this that we have a tendency to make a running start at certain enterprises and get all involved and all engrossed in what it is that we're trying to learn or trying to achieve or trying to do. And as soon as we run into an obstacle or we reach one of those difficult plateaus where we are temporarily paralyzed, that's where we quit. We say, I've reached the limit of my ability. I'll go no further. But the only way to advance in any enterprise is to persevere through that, that level of paralysis so that we can get beyond the roadblock and move ahead. In fact, if you look at something, you will see that, that the higher we go in our attempts to master a procedure, the easier it is 
to get better and better after we learn how to make it through plateaus. Now, what does that have to do with pleasing God? Obviously, uh, not all of us are called to be concert pianists, but all of us are called to please God. I've spoken many times on the priority of the Christian life as Jesus declares it in His teaching when He tells His disciples to seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all of these other things will be added unto you. Elsewhere, Jesus makes a very strange and cryptic statement about this kingdom of God. He speaks about the kingdom of God appearing, and He calls His disciples to press into the kingdom of God, saying that the violent take it by force. Now, that perhaps may be a negative idea suggesting that the enemies of the kingdom of God use violence to try to oppose God's reign, or it may mean, and I think it means, that what he is saying is that those who mean business about pleasing God are not casual or cavalier in their pursuit of the kingdom of God, but they are like men of violence who storm the battlements of the enemy until they break through. Jesus said, that's the way the kingdom is. It's, it's like, he said, a woman who has lost a coin, who sweeps the entire house, turns everything upside down. She's obsessed until she finds that coin. I can't imagine how Jesus was insightful enough in the first century to, 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 to tell a story based on the life of my wife. If you would see what happens in my household when my wife loses her purse, you would know what Jesus had in mind when He talked about this woman sweeping the house clean to find that coin. My wife is always hiding things to keep them safe from burglars or from I don't know what she's hiding them from, but she has these wonderful hiding places for her jewelry and for her purse. The only problem is, is that after she hides them, she forgets where she hides them, and they have been such wonderful hiding places that she can't find what she has hidden. And then we have to go through the procedure, lifting up the rugs, taking the drawers out of the, the car, going through the winter clothes, everything to try to find this thing. Jesus said, the kingdom of God is like a man who finds an extraordinary pearl that is so precious and so valuable, singular in its magnificence, that that person has such a profound passion to possess that pearl, which is more costly than any other pearl, that he goes and sells all that he has that he might possess that one single pearl. Jesus said the kingdom of God is like a man who lost his son. I've already mentioned that son, the prodigal son, who goes to the far country, squanders his father's inheritance. You see these uh, uh, vans, RVs on the highway and bumper stickers on the back of them uh, where you see this nice retired couple driving this wonderful uh, Winnebago down the highway, and it says on the back of the thing, we're spending our children's inheritance. Well, how about when your children spend your children's inheritance before you die? And they say, what, what about a sign on the, kids, on the back of the kids' card that says, I'm spending my dad's retirement money. That's what the prodigal son did. He went out and squandered everything that his father worked so hard to earn. And then he disgraced the family with his riotous living. You know the story. But yet, when he came to himself, and in utter degradation and humiliation after he lived with the pigs and smelled of swine, with his head bowed and in tatters, he started to make his way home. He said to himself, I will arise and I will go to my father. 
But the point of the story is that when that son was still off in the distance, the anxious father who knew nothing of what had happened to his son since his departure saw his boy coming back in the distance and we're told that the prodigal father leapt from his place of seating and ran down the road. I mean, in those days, the Jewish patriarchs wore robes and I can just see this man bare need rushing down the road to find his son and when he found his son, he threw his arms around him and embraced him and he ordered his servants to kill the fatted calf, get the family uh, uh, ring, and he bestowed honor upon his son. He said, because this is my son who once was lost and now is found. All of those parables, the prodigal son, the lost coin, the pearl of great price, are parables that emphasize the importance of pressing in to the kingdom of God of pressing beyond the points of paralysis, the plateau where things become so difficult that we stop. Now, you who are Christians, remember the beginnings of your Christian experience, the zeal and the fire and the passion that you had, and you probably turned off all your friends because you were obnoxious and too pushy and you were so excited you wanted to tell everybody about what happened to you and so on. We all went through that. But then we have learned how to adjust to accommodate our friends, and we've learned how to adjust our goals downward because as we started to grow, we sort of like a puberty spurt, then we suddenly reached that plateau and we cooled off. We said, oh, I'm going to read the Bible from beginning to end. We went through Genesis, we went through Exodus, and then we hit Leviticus. And many of us fell off when we hit Leviticus. Some persevered through Leviticus all the way into Numbers, and after they got into Numbers, they said, I can't do it anymore, and so they quit. And this is what happens. We start, but we don't finish what we start. Well, ladies and gentlemen, what pleases God is somebody who signs up for the duration, somebody who prays every day, Thy kingdom come, somebody who spends his life, not just the beginning of his life, his life seeking the kingdom of God. Again, Edwards made this statement that the seeking of the kingdom of God is not something that unbelievers do. The seeking of the kingdom of God is the chief business of the Christian. And it's a lifelong enterprise. It's a lifelong pursuit. And, and I think that that's what it means to be a disciple, is to come under the discipline of someone more mature. If I wanted to get over my periods of paralysis where I was stuck in music, I had to go to a teacher, a teacher who was on the other side of that plateau, who could help bring me across the threshold into a new liberation and a new freedom. And I think the same thing's true in spiritual life and in spiritual growth. Finally, let me give you this one uh, illustration of how God is pleased by those who seek his kingdom. Again, when I was a boy, I went to a movie, and I don't remember even the exact title of the movie or who even starred in the movie. It had to do with the adventures of Robin Hood. And I don't know whether it was Earl Flynn or Douglas Fairbanks, Jr. I think it was Douglas Fairbanks, Jr. who played in this particular version where Basil Rathbone uh, was the uh, uh, sheriff of Nottingham. And I saw this magic story of Robin Hood on the, on the screen, and I was captured by it. What a tremendous story. The king of the land, Richard, has to depart and go on a spiritual mission. And while he is gone, his reign and his power and his authority is usurped by wicked Prince John, his younger brother. Now, Robin Hood is loyal to the king, but the king's gone. 
And so Robin Hood and his men are forced to live out in the woods, finding shelter there in the countryside. And so a price becomes on his head. And we see the conflict throughout the whole story of one who is loyal to a foreign king, to the king who has gone. And he will not submit to the usurper who has supplanted the rightful king. Robin Hood lives to please King Richard, not Prince John. And then at the end of the movie, Sir Richard knights Robin Hood, making him the Earl of Loxley because he persevered. He lived, Robin Hood lived in the presence of his king, under the authority of his king, to the honor and to the glory of his king. I see no finer parallel to the call of the Christian who would please his God than to serve the one who is now enthroned as the King of Kings, and in his absence seek to please him, to honor him, and to obey him.